Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here. Steve Gibson is not. We put a fire in the fireplace where he normally sits because Steve gets the week off. He doesn't like it when he gets a week off, but we made him take a week off so we could cover the best of 2021. The best episodes, the best memories, the best fun jokes. Well, maybe not so many of those. From Security Now, next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 851 for Tuesday, December 28th, 2021. The best of 2021. This episode of Security Now is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Several industries are projected to grow in 2022. If you own a business in one of these growing industries and you need to hire, well, let me tell you, go to ZipRecruiter. They find qualified candidates for your job fast. Try ZipRecruiter free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash security now. Security now. Normally, this is the time when Steve would give you the Vulcan salute. Let me give it to you for you. Steve Gibson, really the hero of the hour when it comes to security. And was this a year or was this a year topped off at, at the beginning by a massive security flaw, thanks to Microsoft, capped off at the end by the worst security flaw in 10 years, and sprinkled throughout with <laughs> security flaws of all kinds. Uh, let's kick things off with uh, the way the year kicked off with solar winds. Solar winds attack details continue to emerge. Uh, as we know, digital attack forensics take takes time. Um, and most of it requires very careful reverse engineering of code, which has been carefully designed to thwart exactly that kind of analysis. So it's not just like, you know, random script kitty code that's like, you know, <laughs> Python source where you just look at it and go, oh, this is what it does. You know, this, especially in the case of the solar wind uh, threat actors, we know and we're going to know a lot more in a minute about how incredibly good they were at their craft. So they designed their stuff to make it very difficult to figure out what it was doing. So we would expect to be learning more about this largest known attack in history over time. And indeed, last Wednesday, the 20th, in a joint posting by the Microsoft 365 Defender Research Team, their Threat Intelligence Center, that's the, you know, the MSTIC that we often talk about, and the Microsoft Cyber Defense Operations Center, that's a new one, the CDOC, C-D-O-C, we learned a great deal more. For what it's worth, it's only more worrisome. Um, Microsoft's joint disclosure was titled Deep Dive into the Solorigate Second Stage Activation from Sunburst to Teardrop to Raindrop. Um, and Microsoft begins their quite lengthy disclosure with a summary of what everyone knows and then, but quickly adds some new detail, which is interesting. They said, more than a month into the discovery of Solorigate, investigations continue to unearth new details that prove it is one of the most sophisticated and protracted intrusion attempts of the decade. Our continued analysis of threat data shows that the attackers behind Solorigate are skilled campaign operators who carefully planned and executed the attack, remaining elusive while maintaining persistence. These attackers appear to be knowledgeable about operations security and performing malicious activity with minimal footprint. In this blog, we'll share new information to help better understand how the attack transpired. Our goal is to continue empowering the defender community by helping to increase their ability to hunt for the earliest artifacts of compromise and protect their networks from this threat. They said, we've, per we've published our in-depth analysis of the Solorigate backdoor malware, also referred to as Sunburst, 
by FireEye. The compromised DLL that was deployed on networks as part of SolarWinds products that allowed attackers to gain backdoor access to affected devices. We've also detailed the hands-on keyboard techniques that attackers employed on compromised endpoints using a powerful second-stage payload, one of several custom Cobalt Strike loaders, including the loader dubbed Teardrop by FireEye and a variant named Raindrop by Symantec. One missing link in the complex Solorigate attack chain is the handover from the Solorigate DLL backdoor to the Cobalt Strike loader. Our investigations show that the attackers went out of their way to ensure that these two components are separated as much as possible to evade detection. This blog provides details about this handover based on a limited number of cases where this process has been observed to occur. To uncover these cases, we use the powerful cross-domain optics of Microsoft 365 Defender to gain visibility across the entire attack chain in one complete and consolidated view. We'll also share our deep dive into additional hands-on keyboard techniques that the attackers used during initial reconnaissance data collection and exfiltration, which complement the broader TTPs from similar investigative blogs, such as those from FireEye and Velocity. And so I'm going to skip over a lot of that nitty gritty because it's, it's, it's interesting for anyone who's interested and I've got the link in the show notes, but here's the cool bit that is understandable. They said an attack timeline that solar winds disclosed in a recent blog showed that a fully functional Solorigate DLL backdoor was compiled at the end of February, 2020. Okay. So early in 2020 last year, and distributed to systems sometime in late March. The same blog also said that the attackers, and this is uh, this I did not know, removed the Solorigate backdoor code from SolarWinds build environment in June of 2020. They said, considering this timeline and the fact that the Solorigate backdoor was designed to stay dormant for at least two weeks, we approximate that the attackers spent a month or so in selecting victims and preparing unique cobalt strike implants as well as command and control infrastructure. This approximation means that real hands-on keyboard activity most likely started as early as May. The removal of the backdoor generation function and the compromised code from, from SolarWinds binaries in June could indicate that by this time, the attackers had reached a sufficient number of interesting targets and their objectives shifted from deployment and activation of the backdoor, so-called stage one, to being operational on selected victim networks continuing the attack with hands-on keyboard activity using the Cobalt Strike implants. Um, so as I said, again, that was news to me. I assumed that the SolarWinds build and update delivery system had remained infected, but that's not the case. As Microsoft observed, it didn't need to keep offering infected DLLs once all of the major targets had already updated and received the infection. Essentially, they'd, they'd already gotten out over the course of, what, six months? to Well, March, April, May, June. So maybe four months. And then again, in, in observing the highest level of care, they removed the source of the infection so that the SolarWinds DLL would then be clean and further updates would, would remove it 
from the systems that had that had previously um, uh, received it and had already moved into from stage one into stage two. So, you know, a, an act of deliberately um, eliminating the, the tracks of how this all happened. So one of the coolest things Microsoft found was the way the original SolarWinds infection created this arm's length execution path in such a way that the original infection stood a maximum chance of remaining undetected even if its downstream consequences were detected. Remember that the, that the moment it was discovered, um, the moment that it was discovered that a signed SolarWinds DLL was the root source of the infection, that would have brought down the entire operation. Um, and as we know, that is what eventually happened at FireEye, but the obfuscation was successful for a very long time. So here's how Microsoft explains what they found. They said, we spent countless hours investigating Microsoft Defender telemetry and other signals from potential patient zero machines running the backdoored version of SolarWinds DLL. Most of these machines communicated with the initial randomly generated DNS domain. Remember that it was blah, 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 dot avsvmcloud.com. They said, but <coughs> without significant activity. However, we saw limited cases in May and June where the initial DNS network communication was closely followed by network activity on port 443, HTTPS, to other legitimate looking domains. On these handful of machines, we performed deep inspection of telemetry. We know that the Solorigate backdoor only activates for certain victim profiles. And when this happens, the executing process, usually solarwinds.businesslayerhost.exe, creates two files on the victim disk. A VB script, typically named after existing services or folders to blend into legitimate activities on the machine, and a second stage DLL implant, which is a custom cobalt strike loader, typically compiled uniquely per machine and written into a legitimate looking subfolder underneath C colon backslash windows. So, so in other words, they on a on a per on a per infection target, they created a a VB script that was u uniquely named to 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 be like like to fit in to what was going on on that particular machine, and custom wrote and compiled a unique. They called it the Cobalt Strike Loader, again, for that machine. So one of the things this did was it meant you could not compare infected systems. You wouldn't find any obvious indications of compromise that were the same because they were essentially doing per-target customization. Microsoft said at this point, the attackers are ready to activate the Cobalt Strike implant. However, the attackers apparently deem the powerful solar winds backdoor too valuable to lose in case of discovery. So they tried to separate the cobalt strike loader's execution from the solar winds process as much as possible. Their hope is that even if they lose the cobalt strike implant due to discovery and detection, the compromised solar winds binary and the supply chain attack that preceded it will not be exposed. The attackers achieved this by having the solar winds process create an image file execution options, that's IFEO 
debugger registry value for the process DLL host.exe. And I'll just insert an aside here. This is a known and official way of causing Windows to attach a debugger to a process at startup. If, 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 you, if you want to put a, a given uh, Windows process under debugging, uh, sometimes it's not enough to attach the debugger um, after the process is already initialized. You need, like, like there, there may be initialization code that is where the problem is. So you need Windows to start the debugging like from the moment it, the, the process goes into RAM. The way you do that is by using one of this image file execution options, uh, debugger registry values, which causes Windows to automatically load something into that process of space. Um, this, of course, uh, can also be used for malicious purposes. So, so the, the SolarWinds uh, process first created one of these entries, which would uh, for the DLL host.exe. Um, that execution process triggers a launch of WScript exe, which is configured to run that VB script file, which has been dropped earlier and had been waiting. The VB script in turn runs the run DLL32.exe, which activates the Cobalt Strike DLL using a clean parent child process tree, which is completely disconnected from the solar winds process. So essentially, by using this, this sanctioned Windows hook in the registry to cause the DLL host to invoke wscript.exe, the there was a complete separation of these two events, meaning that anybody who did discover the Cobalt Strike DLL and the way it got executed would only see that it had that, that it, it was tied to this debugging. Oh, and once it runs, it removes the IFEO value from the registry to also clean that up. So you can't even figure out how this thing got started if, if you look at it after it's running. So anyway, their, their full posting, as I mentioned, is super long and wonderfully detailed for anyone wanting to really get down into the nitty gritty. But in the section, additional attacker tactics, anti-forensic behavior and operational security, Microsoft nicely summarizes some more detail to give us a more complete sense for the frightening skill and tradecraft that the designers of this attack deployed. They said, as mentioned, the attackers behind Solorigate are skillful and methodic operators who follow operations, security, best practices to minimize traces, stay under the radar, and avoid detection. During our in-depth analysis of the attacker's tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTPs, Seen through the lens of Microsoft 365 Defender's telemetry, we observed a few techniques that are worth disclosing to help other defenders better respond to this incident and use hunting tools like Microsoft 365 Defender, <coughs> advanced hunting, or Azure Sentinel queries to search for, for potential traces of past activity. Some examples of why these attackers stand out for their operational OPSEC methodology and anti-forensic behavior are listed below. And they have six or five. First, methodic avoidance of shared indicators for each compromised host. As discussed in the previous section, each Cobalt Strike DLL implant was prepared to be unique per machine and avoided at any cost overlap and reuse of folder name, file name, export function names, though those are internal to the uh, DLL, uh, command and control domain and IP, HTTP requests, timestamp, file metadata, config, and child processes launched. 
They said this extreme level of variance was also applied to non-executable entities, such as WMI persistence filter name, WMI filter query, passwords used for 7-zip archives, and names of output log files. I mean, so what we're looking at is an absolute lack of laziness. I mean, true discipline for every single uh, entity that they infected. They said, applying this level of permutations for each individual compromised machine is an incredible effort, normally not seen with other adversaries and done to prevent full identification of all compromised assets inside a network or effective sharing of threat intel between victims. Second, camouflage and blending into the environment. Tools and binaries used by the attackers, for example, AD find, you know, Active Directory find, legit tool, were always renamed and placed in folders that mimicked existing programs and files already present on a machine. This blending was not just used for files, but for other elements. For example, WMI persistent filters were created with names and queries matching other scripts present in affected organizations. <laughs> this is just stunning. Third, before running intensive and continued hands-on keyboard activity, the attackers took care of disabling event logging using audit, pol uh, 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 audit policy and re-enabling it afterward. In a similar way, before running noisy network enumeration activities, such as repeated NS lookup and LDAP queries, the attackers carefully prepared special firewall rules to minimize outgoing packets for certain protocols. The firewall rules were also methodically removed after the network reconnaissance was completed. I hope this is terrifying everybody. This is just, it's terrifying me. Lateral movement activities were never executed without preparation. To increase the likelihood that their activities remain undetected, the attackers first enumerated remote processes and services running on the target host and decided to move laterally only after disabling certain security services. And finally, they said, we believe that the attackers used time stomping to change time stamps of artifacts and also leveraged professional wiping procedures and tools to complicate finding and recovering of DLL implants from affected environments. Oh. So I like time stomping. Know, <laughs> I'm going to keep that uh, time in my back pocket, pocket there. <laughs> time stomping. Yes. Stepping back to take stock, stock in all that we have learned, any sane InfoSec technologist would be right to be seriously worried. My feeling is that as damaging as these attacks were individually and on their own, it's almost more worrisome uh, that it, it, it's almost more worrisome outcome for the attackers is for us to have obtained this much greater appreciation for their skill and their dedication to detail. You know, it, I mean, it, it has without question sobered up and, and heightened the, the level of attention that, that the defender industry now realizes it needs to deploy. And remember, none of us should forget for a moment that were it not for the fact that they targeted FireEye and that their presence eventually tripped some monitoring alarms that the attackers were unaware of, because as we've just seen, if they knew about it, they would have either aborted or they would have disabled those monitoring alarms. Something tripped them up. If that had not happened, this would all still be ongoing right now. Wow. 
And Leo, on that happy note, let's <laughs> take our second well, break. You know, and it's funny because there's not a lot of reporting anymore on this. It's kind of, you know, taking the backseat. Old, I think, old news. Well, but also I think part of the problem is it doesn't feel like there's much we can do about it. It's like, yeah, they're in there. Uh, what do you want to do about it? <laughs> you know, it's like it's it's like uh, the the deed is done. Yeah, the good news is I think that that this level. I mean, so for Microsoft to post this, like, I'm glad they're paying attention. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Th there's a you know, um, it's any companies, for example, who thought, oh, you know, um, we're busy. I mean, yeah, who isn't? We don't have enough money. Yeah, who does? Uh, you know, we don't want to like deeply invest in internal, uh, you know, n n uh, network monitoring <laughs> surveillance. Well, yeah. think about that again, <laughs> folks. Yeah. You know, re reconsider the cost of not doing that. You need an intrusion, de you know, detection system that can, you know, spot something that is doing this and you need to hide it. That's the other thing we've learned. You know, the, 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 the fact that it's possible for, for the bad guys to see machines and then remotely enumerate their running processes, um, you know, a, a lot has been learned. I think that's key. I agree, Leo, that on, on the general public level, it's like, oh, well, the, maybe the Russians hacked us. Uh, what's for lunch? Yeah. Um, I hope we're doing the same. <laughs> <laughs> Back to on them. our internal level, you know, the, the this has to have really uh, sobered up oh, yeah. the the defense industry, and it should. And yeah, yes. And I yes. have to say, and probably somewhat due to this, uh, I noticed Biden has been uh, st starting to appoint people to cybersecurity roles and really beefing up uh, cybersecurity and picking some, I think, some good people. Uh, knowledgeable people, not just figureheads to do it. So I think that's, you know, that's the other side of it is that you're going to see, I hope you're going to see the U.S. government be uh, very proactive about this. They yeah, ap be. appointing people who are anti-cybersecurity to yeah, run cybersecurity. That's not a good idea. That's not, <laughs> that's that's not less of a good, good idea. idea. Um, yeah. What do potato chips have to do with security? Well, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, we love ZipRecruiter. So thrilled that ZipRecruiter would uh, sponsor the holiday episode of this show. It makes a lot of sense because I think 2022 is going to be a big year for hiring. People are going to be coming back to work. Companies are going to be reopening. Several industries projected to grow in 2022. Um, I think it's going to be a, a, an incredible year. A couple of the areas ZipRecruiter has pinpointed as being hot, sustainability. I think that's pretty obvious. New eco-friendly products and services cropping up. You know what's going to be big in 2022? Pet services. Pet services. More training, walking, and feeding services for all those pets people adopted during COVID. Fitness. We're going back to the gym. Uh, and for many people... Uh, you know, non-traditional workout studios like kickboxing and Pilates are taken off. Uh, I have a friend who owns a couple of Body Rocks. They're hiring. Digital events and conferences, they're back. The CES, it's back. So uh, there's going to be a lot of work planning and hosting online events and in-person events in the 2022. Home improvement. Those of us who are stuck at home have been doing a lot of home improvement. Uh, in fact, I have to tell you, it's been really hard to get to find people to come in, handymen, contractors. That's a big growth area. If you work for or you own a business in one of these growing industries or a whole lot of other industries, it may well be that you are hiring and you need to hire fast. Well, there's only one place to go. That's ZipRecruiter. Right now, you could try it free at ZipRecruiter.com slash security now, why is ZipRecruiter better? Oh, I can go on and on because we use it. We love it. Uh, for one thing, uh, once you post on ZipRecruiter, your job listing goes wide. More than 100 uh, job listing websites, social networks. You're more likely to reach the right person for that job than anywhere else. ZipRecruiter also makes it easy because instead of flooding your 
inbox with emails or your phone with messages. ZipRecruiter handles it all internally in their easy-to-use interface where they reformat all the resumes to make them easy to read. And then there's one thing ZipRecruiter does that makes a huge difference. ZipRecruiter, when you post a listing in ZipRecruiter, searches through all the resumes they have access to to find candidates that are right for your job. You get the list, you send them an invite, uh, history shows that when people get invited to apply for a job, they're much more likely to apply. This has really made a difference. It means people who use ZipRecruiter on average will get qualified candidates within the first day. In fact, for us, it's been within hours of posting that listing. That is exactly what you want. Ain't nobody got time to spend weeks hiring. Get it done fast. ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site in the U.S. based on G2 ratings. And again, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. If your business is booming, ZipRecruiter.com slash security now. ZipRecruiter.com slash security now. S-E-C-U-R-I-T-Y-N-O-W. Please use that address so they know you saw it here. Uh, and, and thank you, ZipRecruiter, for supporting us all these years. We look forward to a great 2022 together. Now, <clears throat> back to the best of security now. Who would have thought? <laughs> Potato chips <laughs> would be involved in uh, security. This is another one of those classic what could possibly go wrong moments? Listen. This you're just not going to believe. Um, and before adding this to today's show, I had to like really drill down and verify that it was true <laughs> uh, and not an April Fool's posting. Oh, dear. But it appears to be 100% legitimate. Uh, and I learned this from Bleeping Computer, who's very good about vetting their stories. It is a Chrome browser web extension called Crispy Subtitles from Lay's. What? Yeah. Lay's potato chips? Yeah, Lay's potato chips. After this browser extension has been installed, <laughs> anytime you are watching a YouTube video yeah. and the, the system's AI-trained microphone detects the sound of crispy <laughs> chips being eaten, YouTube captions will be automatically enabled to allow anyone, including yourself, to be able to obtain the video's dialogue information over the sound of the crunch? those noisy chips being crunched. That's hysterical. Yes. That's L hysterical. Lawrence Abrams at Bleeping Computer explained that to make it easier to watch YouTube videos, the creative agency Happiness Saigon partnered with Frito-Lay to create the Lay's Crispy Subtitles browser extension that <laughs> automatically enables YouTube captions when it detects you are eating chips. Lawrence says that to achieve this, Happiness Saigon trained an AI algorithm using 178 hours of recordings of people eating chips from all over the world. <laughs> he, furthermore, he said that Bleeping Computer used the extension and was pleasantly surprised by how the extension immediately enabled YouTube captions when their microphone picked up the noisy sound of chips being eaten. He added that they had performed some tests with other food groups, including peanuts, carrots, and cereal. While peanuts and carrots were not noisy enough or crunchy enough, eating cereal also enabled captions in their tests to see what would trigger the extension. He concluded, your results may vary depending upon how noisy you That's eat your food. hysterical. That so, is Hysterical. Just wow. like really, is this true? This is if they, if it were at the end of uh, it's just good marketing. March, it's marketing, you know. Yeah, I don't think wonderful. many people will install it. <laughs> it's not malicious, right? I mean, 
It's just no, no. no as far as we know, Works it's a legitimate app from Frito Lay <laughs> to advertise. Like now, you can munch and crunch and not worry about having to turn the volume up or bothering anybody else. You'll just get captions. That's very I mean, funny. really, this Leo. This is why we have computer technology. Yes. <laughs> this was what it was all meant to do. Dan Kaminsky uh, cut a wide swath through the computer industry. Um, he was a prolific tweeter um, and a, a real character and personality. He and I were last together. Um, we followed each other on stage during DigiCert's uh, first security conference, and Dan peppered me with some questions about Squirrel back then, uh, and I was able to satisfy uh, his his many uh, salient questions. Um, he was probably first on the map for this podcast when he realized, in doing some just some research that he was always up to, that the transactions which the in, all of the DNS servers throughout the industry were using had way too little entropy. Their, their port numbers for the queries they were generating were often sequential, so they were marching through the port space. And often the transaction IDs, which are is a 16-bit number that is used to associate queries with the replies when they come back. Those were also sometimes a fixed, well, they weren't a fixed number. Ports were sometimes fixed, but they, the transaction IDs might just be an incrementing counter. And what Dan realized was that the lack of query entropy being emitted by DNS servers allowed replies to be spoofed. You could ask a DNS server yourself something and see where its counters were and then induce somebody else to ask it a question and provide a spoofed reply before the real reply would get back. And because you knew where the counters were, you were able to, with high accuracy, uh, get a spoof to be accepted as legitimate. And that's then with you know because because the DNS runs over U, uh, UDP, there is no TCP handshake to validate IPs, so you're able to completely spoof the replies. So what this meant was, if the world were to to realize that, as Dan had privately. Um, it would be a catastrophe. So Dan privately got in touch with all the purveyors of the various DNS servers. They all recognized what he had. And privately, all of the servers were updated and a, an industry-wide reveal was coordinated in order to maximize the, the probability of getting all this fixed with that before the bad guys had a chance to abuse it. So, uh, and of course, because I recognize this was a problem and we covered it on the podcast, we owe Dan the existence of my DNS spoofability service, which I created in honor of his discovery, which allowed in, uh, you know, individuals to go to the, to GRC's DNS spoofability. I arranged to 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 cause by, by my by setting up my own DNS like pseudo DNS servers, I could cause a a visitor to my site's DNS to tr to use me as its resolver, and then I collected all the queries that I was inducing through that web page, and and analyze the nature of the queries coming from. The, the DNS servers that, that the user is using. Anyway, um, uh, Dan uh, has a large following. Uh, I think, what is it? Uh, I had it here in my notes somewhere. 93, oh, 94.3 thousand followers on Twitter. Um, he, as I said, he's a prolific Twitter uh, tweeter. He joined Twitter in 2007. Since then... He has posted 130,000 tweets. Now, if we, if we assume an average tweet rate 
over 14 years. That's 9,285.71 tweets per year. Wow. Or an average of 25.42 <laughs> tweets or commented retweets per day. That's amazing. So if you were following Dan, you you knew what he was thinking and doing. Um, and uh, he was also quite literate. Um, he pinned a tweet of his from January 16th, 2018, to the top of his feed. He wrote this. I'm increasingly thinking that every functioning system has two forms. The abstraction that outsiders are led to believe and the reality that insiders actually and carefully operate. You don't incrementally learn a system you eventually unlearn its necessary lies. <laughs> That's really good. So, and I think you it's know, absolutely right. Absolutely. Just really, really good stuff. Um, he had a site, dankaminsky.com, which was his personal blog. And he hasn't blogged in about four years. But the, he, his, his last blog, I'll just share a couple of paragraphs from it. Um, he wrote... Cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generators, right? We've talked about them a lot, a lot, CSPRNGs, he says, are interesting. Given a relatively small amount of data, just 128 bits is fine, they generate an effectively unlimited stream of bits completely indistinguishable from the ephemeral quantum noise of the universe, the output is as deterministic as the digits of pi, but no degree of scientific analysis, no amount of sample data will ever allow a model to form for what bits will come next. In a way, CSPRNGs represent the most practical demonstration of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, which states that for a sufficiently complex system, there can be things that are true about it that can never be proven within the rules of that system. Science is literally the art of compressing vast amounts of experimentally derived output on the nature of things to a beautiful series of rules that explains it. But as much as we can model things from their output with math, math can create things we can never model. There can be a thing that is true. There are hidden variables in every CSPRNG, but we would never know. And so, an interesting question emerges. If a CSPRNG is indistinguishable from the quantum noise of the universe, how would we know if the quantum noise of the universe uh -oh. was not itself uh -oh. a CSPRNG? Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> There's an infinite number of ways to construct a random number generator. What if nature tried its luck and made one more? Would we know? Would it be any good? So... Anyway, we have wow. lost That's a, beautiful, a, beautiful thing. a critical thinker hmm. uh, among us who made all manner of contributions to uh, security and the Internet. And uh, he was working on some weird JavaScript stuff that I never really tracked. Um, but we have, and I wanted to play it into the podcast so that it is captured, a minute and 45 second video which he and his young niece produced 13 years ago, uh, niece Sarah, following Black Hat 2008, which was where this the DNS problem uh, was first revealed. Um, so here's and this is fun because his niece is precocious and 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 following a script that he produced, but it's they made a really fun minute and minute and 45 seconds. I'm security researcher Dan Kaminsky, and I'm here today with my niece, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Hey, Sarah. So Sarah here has an important message for all of you. Fix your DNS. It's so important and so cool. Well, what's DNS, Sarah? Well, Uncle Daniel, I think you should know. 
Be that as it may, why don't you tell the people about there a little bit about it? Well, DNS is a domain name system. It tells my computer where on the internet all my favorite websites are. Was well, there something wrong with DNS? It'll be okay. Everyone got together a while back to make sure everything would work out. Oh, everybody? Even ISC, the makers of Bind, and Microsoft, and Cisco, and Nama, Nama... You mean Nominum? A totally Nominum. Well, that's really cool. So, so what should everyone do, sir? Well, this is really geeky stuff, but most people should get automatic updates and be okay. Well, who might not? Well, there might be some servers that don't get automatic updates because they're really important and people want to keep an eye on them. Oh, so we should ask those people to take a look? Totally. Oh, well, when should they look? Right now, duh. Well, when do they have to fix it by? Well, the attack is pretty weird, but people will probably figure it out after a month. So I'll give you an exact date. August 6th, 2008. August 6th? August 6th. All right, then. Well, is there any way for the non-geeks to make sure they're safe? Uh, only if you build them a website. Hmm, I'll get right on that. <laughs> you better. Well, thanks, Sarah. And there you have it. Kids, talk to your parents about their DNS. They'll be glad you did. <laughs> All right, that's All a right, wrap. That's a wrap. Okay, Woo! thanks, cousin Dan, <laughs> and thank you, Maddie. Oh, that's Woo! so sweet. Yeah. Oh right, my god. Oh, I'm sure they miss him terribly. And of course, yeah, uh, his friend sure Steve been... wrote something in assembly to do that, so it was okay. He didn't have to. <laughs> he didn't have to do that. Wow. 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 Yeah. Wow. Very cool. Oh, um, also, uh, DefCon has announced on their Twitter feed that they're having an online memorial for Dan on Sunday, May 2nd on their, on the DEFCON Discord channel, discord.gg slash DEFCON. Nice. So nice. Uh, they tweeted, come share your favorite stories and join us in celebrating the life of a hacker whose life elevated the whole community. Wow. Good. Yep. Uh, thank you for doing that, Steve. Um, yeah. Of course, we his name comes up all the time on our shows. Yeah, yeah, uh, he'll be missed. Yeah, good yeah. guy. Yeah. Uh, and for what it's worth, DanKaminsky.com, dot com. I only shared the top of that really cool posting. He gets really into it. So you know, if you're wondering maybe if in fact we are in the matrix, uh, Dan uh, may give you some pause. Of course, I don't know how long the site will be up. Hopefully, uh, it'll stay. So two weeks ago, shortly before Apple's big spring-loaded product announcement event, the Soden Group, which is behind the Revil ransomware, began publicly leaking Apple's proprietary designs for its forthcoming Mac laptops. Uh, the, the group's so-called happy blog, <laughs> as it calls itself, stated, in order not to wait... For the upcoming Apple presentations, today we, the Revil Group, will provide data on the upcoming releases of the company so beloved by many. Tim Cook can say thank you, Quanta. Um, from our side, a lot of time has been devoted to solving this problem, unquote. Well, okay, so Quanta is Quanta Computer is a Taiwanese company that assembles a number of Apple laptops and other consumer devices. I know they're watched uh, uh, as, as well, and I'm, you, I'm sure you, Leo, are more tuned up on this than I am since you, you get to talk to your Mac folks. Yeah, they um, do the laptops, I think. Is there a, Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when Quanta initially refused to negotiate with the Revil Group, Quanta, Quanta Computer is the... Is the is a large supplier, not only for Apple, but for others. Uh, in some of the news coverage, I saw that they said ThinkBook uh, but or ThinkPad, but I wasn't sure whether that one might have been a typo oh, or maybe they actually are doing like construction for Lenovo. Wow. I don't know. Um, but anyway, it was Quanta Computer that was actually compromised by the, the Revil ransomware. Um, it says so, all 10 top PC companies in the world use Quanta. Yeah, so yeah. that's all of them, including Lenovo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Wow. So, uh, and, you know, and that's not the company. Well, it is the company that you would want to g get inside if you were a ransomware gang. Yeah. And, of course, Apple would be particularly sensitive to the disclosure. We know how, like, 
concerned they are o- over leaks. So they would be cons- you know, particularly concerned over this disclosure. Uh, the ransom demand was initially posted just hours before Apple's event. Uh, and the hackers said that they would release more documents every day, adding, quote, we recommend that Apple buy back the available data by May 1st. Um, and a similar extortion attempt from the same group uh, aimed at Acer demanded $50 million in exchange for deleting Acer's files. And I saw the same number. $50 million was like the opening extortion level uh, also for the, the Apple stuff. Hmm. So groups throughout the Internet began grabbing and analyzing the details from the leaks. Um, and they, the, you know, this, this stuff looked authentic, and there's no reason to believe it wouldn't be. They noted some differences with the current models on sale. A new version of the MacBook Pro was shown without the touch bar, and it appeared that maybe HDMI ports might be staging a comeback along with SD card readers. So, yeah, it, this, you know, this early release was providing details that Apple would have rather <laughs> been releasing themselves. Um, what we know of Revil from the past is that they are tough negotiators who do not make idle threats. Of course, they don't want to acquire a, a reputation for not doing what they say they're going to do or people will start, you know, start ignoring them. So they're also not known for being soft or for backing down. So something must be going on because last week the Revil gang removed Apple's schematics, drawings, and other data from their data leak site after first warning Quanta that they would leak drawings for the new iPad and the new Apple logos, which I thought was interesting. I was like, what? New Apple logos? So anyway, maybe, maybe Apple said, okay, look, you know, Quanta, well, you know, we need to stop this. Um, it did get quiet. They only released two schem- schematics that I saw. Right. Um, and so um, uh, what appears to have happened, for reasons we can only guess, is that Quanta finally responded to Revil and opened a dialogue. As part of a private chat, uh, and I think it was Bleeping Computer who posted some screenshots of that, which they got somehow, uh, Revil told Quanta that they hid the data leak page and will stop talking to reporters to allow negotiations to continue. And Revel stated that, quote, having started a dialogue with us, you can count on a good discount. And indeed, that does appear to be the case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the Act extortion. today to save 20%. <laughs> oh, no, that's exactly what happens. Uh, so uh, since... The, the, the demand was updated. It now carries an expiration date of this coming Friday, May 7th. But it's been reduced from the initial request of $50 million down to the now much more seemingly affordable $20 million. See, I, uh, I can't and, see uh, Apple paying a penny, uh, and Quanta shouldn't either. But at the same time, I also could see Apple being very concerned. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is stuff they're going to announce in June. (sighs) Various researchers have been quoted saying that this appears to be a a pattern. The Revil gang apparently feels that forcing the opening of a dialogue, you know, with with their victim uh, is a crucial first step in getting paid. So what appears to be happening is that we're seeing a pattern of them deliberately establishing like a reputation for dramatically reducing their initial ransom demand upon the establishment of a dialogue. So this this asking 50 and immediately dropping to 20, that's what people are now coming to expect. And of course, I guess this provides some incentive for a victim to establish contact in order to obtain, you know, the more real ransom demand 
Uh, and also, of course, in the process serves to break the ice. And it's like, well, now, you know, I mean, of course, we're all put in mind of that old joke about prostitution, you know, like, OK, well, we've we've determined what you are. Now we're just negotiating a price. Uh, so, you know, this is the world we're in. And of course, we'll be talking about uh, this takedown uh, task force here or, or the, the well, the ransomware uh, task force shortly. Boy, you could almost say that this was the year of the rise and fall of Revil. I mean, fascinating to watch. And, of course, we covered that uh, each step of the way on Security Now. Coming up, we'll talk CAPTCHAs. Uh, actually, they call this the Doom CAPTCHA. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think it captured on, to be honest. Okay, Leo, you're going to want to go and see it and, and test your skill. It took me an embarrassing number of times to prove I was human. Uh, GRC.SC slash 820. It is our shortcut of the week. I hate these the, captures. I just hate them. Well, this is the Doom capture. Um, it's a is joke. It my Doom or your Doom? Uh, uh, my it's, Doom, huh? Okay. It's... At, well, no, it is the game Doom. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so kill four enemies. I think a computer could do this very easily. One, two. I mean, really, how hard is this? A oh, game over. Yeah, you didn't do it quick enough, Leo. You got to do it fast. Computer could do it slowly. I see there. Whoa. Oh. You okay, know what? See now, I like that. This tell this tells me you really have been spending a lot of time <laughs> shooting stuff. I spent a lot of time playing it, Doom. <laughs> it took me like ten tries what? to get that to get that green check mark. One, yeah. two. Oh, I see the red progress bar is my time. Yep. I get yep. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't like this anyway. then? I get it. I take. But no, I just thought it. It was just it. It, it occurred to the guy last Saturday morning. It's funny. He coded it by the That's end of the hysterical. day. Uh, it made number one product of the day over on Product, product Hunt. Hunt. Yeah. yeah, it's just a little embed. Look at that. Yeah, it's so it's simple. Just a cute, yeah. just a cute little thing. So, anyway, I just I wanted to share it with our listeners. I thought I knew that a lot of uh, we old timers would recognize that and, and get a kick out. Oh of wait it. a minute, I didn't have the sound to on, turned on. Is oh that, yeah, yeah, is yeah. Doom sound in this. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Let's see. <laughs> Because I got the doom sound effect. <laughs> That's hysterical. I wonder how Carmack is at this. That's great. How fun is that? That's hysterical. Bloomberg reported on Friday that some of the well, some of the findings by Mandiant, which is the group within FireEye, who has been working with Colonial Pipeline to figure out how this happened. As always, attribution and post-attack forensics is difficult. But there's very strong evidence to support the theory that the attackers used a compromised VPN account password. <sighs> yep. It was just like the Florida water plant. They were all using the same password. Yep. And yep. Uh, the, the account was no longer active, but it was still usable. Right. The Ridiculous. VPN login, the, I know. The, I completely No two agree factor. With, Ridiculous. Yep. The VPN login in question, which lacked any multi-factor authentication protection, was not in use, but it had been left active as and it was at the time of the attack. The account's password was discovered inside a batch of leaked passwords on the dark web. And you this know why that was. Oh, go ahead. I'll let you finish the yep, sentence. Yep. This suggests that an employee of the company may have reused that same password yes. on another account that was previously breached. So Colonial was not requiring password managers. They were letting pa employees set their own passwords. Monkey123. Yep. Oh, I use it on everything. It's easy to remember. <sighs> Unbelievable. Yep. Unbelievable. So the, the takeaways are a little late, uh, and it's always easy to admonish with I told you so's after the fact, but unused accounts should always be disabled. Uh, 
authentication should require multiple factors. And I suppose that while I've never been a fan of forced password changing, so long as the new passwords are unique and not shared, forcing a change might have prevented this entire mess. I was recently informed that my logon to the management portal for level three would be expiring since I had not logged into it in six months. Okay, that's annoying, but it's good policy. And for things that are mission critical, like remote VPN access into a corporate network, the pain is clearly worth the gain. So, yeah, um, the, the, the one good thing that will arise from this attention, this is, this is not unwanted attention. This is good attention that the world is now paying to this because, as we've often talked about, the CIOs, the chief information officers, have been running around the C-suite executives screaming about needing more, more, more. We need more budget. We need more closet space. We need, you know, whatever it is. You know, they are resource constrained. You know, we need to replace this crap, which is 20 years old, because we can't. And the bosses, well, it works, don't it? Uh, <laughs> it works <laughs> until it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it works until nothing suddenly does. And this uh, this was the IT department was uh, was hacked. So surely they should have done better. Yeah, again, the, the, the beauty of the press is that, you know, when the executives go home, their wives are now asking them, mm -hmm. honey, uh, you know, things that never occurred to them mm -hmm. to ask, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what's mm -hmm. the budget for, you know, <laughs> for your company's security? Because, you know, I, I would really hate if Mabel at the club, you know, were, was able to scold me for, you know, your company being attacked. And so put plastic bags of gasoline in their trunk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which should never have to happen. Before you uh, go into this uh, next story about John McAfee, I do want to tell people what you're about to hear might be triggering if you're considering suicide. There is a national suicide prevention lifeline in the United States. You can call right now for free and get uh, free confidential support if you're in distress. Great crisis resources for you or your loved ones is one 800 273 talk 1 800 273 8255. We just want to be responsible since we're going to talk about uh, John McAfee next. That's good. And and we know that COVID has been a, an extra stressor for people, especially too. teenagers. Uh, I know of two teenagers who uh, uh, took the very poor choice um, because of, I think, because of loneliness during COVID. So, yeah, we're all going through it, but you don't have to go through it alone. And if you're not in the United States, uh, you can Google Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and you'll be able to find one in your area. Good. I'm, don't I'm don't we don't you. we don't want to lose you. We don't. We, we you know we want you to be around. Anyway, yeah, um, I, I was I was unhappy when I was younger. And, it's normal, you know, and that's the I'm problem with suicide. I, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. You know, it, things do get better. I, I know, and uh, but sometimes we we just can't take it, and don't don't do yeah. it. Don't do it. So uh, I wanted to note that last Wednesday, uh, John McAfee uh, was found dead by hanging uh, at the age of 75 in his jail cell in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, his extradition to the United States, where he would have been facing a number of legal charges of willful tax evasion, had finally been approved by a court in Spain. Uh, and despite his earlier statements that he would never take his own life. Uh, and he said that foul play would definitely be involved if he ever appeared to have done so. Uh, everyone assumes that he changed his mind uh, and, and that that must have been what happened. His attorney said that his nine months in prison uh, had brought him to despair and attempts to revive him had failed. Um, and as we all know, uh, John was a character and a half. Uh, 
you know, with a life full of antics. I think that the first time we talked about him on this podcast was when uh, he was being sought in connection. Of course, he was famous, right, because of McAfee and McAfee Systems and McAfee yeah. AV. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize he had some connection to Zone Alarm, which was a little he, horrifying yeah, for me. Funny. Well, but back in the day, I think he was um, quite a bit more respectable. <laughs> uh, you know, he made $100 million selling McAfee to uh, Intel. Yeah. So he, he did quite well. But he, he squ- as far as we know, he squandered almost all of it uh, in kind of... Oddball. Well, and things, things went w- weird too. I yeah. think the first time we talked about him was when he was being sought in connection with the murder of his neighbor, a guy by the name of Gregory Fall, F A U L L. In Belize. Yes. Yeah. He, he was his next door neighbor in Belize. His, th- this neighbor had been found dead, shot in the back of his head with a nine millimeter. Uh, and, and prior to that, Gregory had previously confronted John after one of John's quite aggressive dogs had bitten someone in the area. And the dogs were apparently known to get loose and run in wild in packs, terrifying the community. So, you know, he was a source, McAfee was, of adventure and controversy. <laughs> adventure is a good word for it, yeah. Uh, in his earlier years, he had worked at NASA, uh, Xerox, and Lockheed Martin before launching the world's first commercial antivirus software in 87. And in fact, he and I interacted just once by phone. Well, that's what I was curious if you had met him. Yeah. Uh, it was before his launch of McAfee AV. Uh, after I had written a series of three columns in InfoWorld, which he was reading, which imagined with as much detail and accuracy as I could exactly how a theoretical software virus would behave. Oh, interesting. And I don't recall now how clear I made it that this was conjecture, but a quite animated John McAfee who was unknown by the PC industry at the time, phoned my office, wanting to compare notes and virus samples. He was sure that, like, and amazed to discover that I had viruses, clearly, because I had exactly described (laughs) the behavior of the viruses he had. And he was very disappointed to learn. And actually, it took me some time to convince him and, like, talk him down. And and I'm unsure that I ever really did. I I think he just he didn't really believe that my three-column series about software viruses was entirely written from my imagination as a software developer, not as a virus discoverer. Anyway, I I said, sorry, John. I'm, like, really... (laughs) Really, really, I don't have any. I, you know, if I was the, if I was a virus, this is what I, this is how I would behave. And he's like, really? Oh, well, I, I thought we could, you know, I'd, sh- I'd show you mine if you showed me yours. Mm. So anyway, he, uh, I, I saw some stories about him fairly aggressively uh, calling people uh, to get information uh, or or copies of viruses. He was working at Lockheed when he uh, got a copy of The Brain in the late 80s and started writing McAfee. But, you know, I think he wanted to write an antivirus, but he needed to understand what it was he was blocking, what he was preventing. Yeah. Uh, did and a good job. Funny. It worked, right? It's funny you mentioned that, Leo, because um, I was thinking the same thing this morning. Like, okay, we know how they work now, so w- would it have been behavior based? I, it's hard to imagine it would have been like signature based because what there there, there like, weren't any. There were four or something. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know. You know. Yeah. So crazy. He probably was trying and to come he, up with heuristics so that you could watch for a certain kind of behavior. Um, that's that's the ideal way to do it. Signatures plus heuristics. But I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And we didn't have an internet back then. So they had to live, they had to jump from floppy to floppy. You had to send them a floppy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, John, I got one. It's on a floppy here. We we, we didn't have USB. We didn't have thumb drives. All we had, the only thing that that, that was transportable was diskettes. And so the viruses, such as they were, had to be very tiny. I think I remember that some of them lived in track zero because there were still, I think there was still cylinder alignment. So I think there was space 
on track zero after the boot sector. And so you'd have, there were like, there were, I, I, I remember boot sector viruses. I mean, they That's had to right. be That's right. really, really small. So if you put it, what you do is you put it on the boot sector of a floppy. And if somebody booted that floppy, attempted to boot from that floppy, it would infect their system. This is pre hard, hard drives. drive, or did it have it hard drives? The, okay. Oh yeah, jump to the hard if drive. If they had a hard drive, right. a, 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 or it would go into RAM and then move on to any, any other any other floppy that, you used that yes. they then stuck right. in. Yeah. Did you now tell the truth? Did you expect to hear Steve Gibson's memories of John McAfee on the best of episode? Maybe you did. Maybe you did. Uh, on we go uh, with our best of holiday episode of Security Now. Um. This is one very important. I took it seriously. Uh, in fact, as Steve is telling T-Mobile customers what to do, I was doing it. <laughs> Watch. The news from T-Mobile is all bad. Last week, T-Mobile confirmed their latest data breach, making it the fifth data breach in four years. <laughs> they're, you know, they're going to have to start explaining to someone like what their problem is. Uh, there were two previous attacks in 2020, you know, last year, one in 2019 and the first in 2018. But this most recent breach is the largest by far. And the numbers of affected customers keep growing. They like, as they keep digging into this, like, well, what, what, what happened? We, we, you know, first it was like, wait, we, we got breached? Who says? You know, they didn't know, uh, <laughs> literally, until someone started selling the content on the dark web. The most recent update reveals that the cyber attack exposed over 54 million individuals' data. Last weekend, a threat actor began selling the personal information claiming it was 100 million T-Mobile customers on a hacking forum for, he was asking six Bitcoin, which is about 280K right now. Because as you commented recently, Leo, Bitcoin is coming back. I think it was on Sunday. Almost it's 50. coming back. It's creeping yeah. back up again. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm moaning about the 50 that I just said, eh. <laughs> Who don't, needs don't these? think about it, Steve. Uh, don't think about it. It's not a, yeah, So yeah, this is the, the text best. I got from T-Mobile. Unauthorized yeah. access to some of your personal data. We have no evidence. Of course, they're morons, but we have no evidence that your debit credit card information was compromised. But we're going to give you, just in case, three years of credit monitoring. Free. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. we'll talk about what users should do in a second. Yeah. Our, cert, ho hopefully all of our listeners have. So this hacker claimed that the stolen database contains the data for approximately 100 million T-Mobile customers. Now, here's the bad part. This is not one of those, well, yeah, they got the hashed password. Oh, no. no. <laughs> the exposed data can include customers IMSI, I -E -M -E -I. I -M -E -I. Oh, S-I. What's that? I -M -S -I. I know I am. -E That's one of the other things. Okay. You know, they're yeah. big crypto, you know, like right. strings of no numbers. But you don't want anybody to have them because they right. could get up to mischief, like clone your, your sims and things. Phone numbers, customer names, security pins, social security numbers, <sighs> driver's license numbers, and date of birth. <sighs> and, 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 of course, names, right? So, in other words, the keys to the identity theft kingdom. Yeah. The database was said to have been stolen approximately three weeks ago, apparently when T-Mobile was on vacation, uh, and contains customer data dating back as far as 2004. In an interview with the hacker, which Lawrence Abrams of Bleeping Computer, he's, he's the Bleeping Computer's founder, <clears throat> Lawrence Abrams had this interview, reported that the hacker said their entire IMEI history database going back to 2004 was stolen. You know, so that's all of the, of the basically the serial numbers of all the T-Mobile phones that they've had accounts for uh, since 04. Uh, okay, and that was what a, a year before the podcast, so 18 years uh, of data that's been stolen. After the data first went up for sale. T-Mobile later confirmed, oh, 
Some of our servers have been hacked, <laughs> what do you know, and began investigating what customer data had been exposed. Last Tuesday, on August 17th, T-Mobile T-Mobile first said that the personal information of 48.6 million individuals was exposed during the attack. They later updated that to include an additional 6 million customers, oh, 6 million more, uh, or prospective customers who are also affected by the attack. You don't even have to have, like, you know, signed on the dotted line. No, you just open a conversation with T-Mobile and your, <laughs> and your history. So T-Mobile also confirmed that the attackers stole their customers' IMSI and IMEI numbers. That was confirmed. Okay, so here's a breakdown. 13.1 million current T-Mobile postpaid customer accounts as opposed to, you know, dis distinct from prepaid. So 13.1 million current T-Mobile postpaid customer accounts that included first and last names, date of birth, social security number, and driver's license slash ID information. Bad. Bad T-Mobile. Bad. 40 million former or prospective T-Mobile customers, including first and last names, date of birth, social security number, and driver's license slash ID information. Okay, so a total of 53.1 with all of that. Basically, game over. 667,000 accounts of former T-Mobile customers exposing customer names, phone numbers, addresses, and dates of birth were compromised. 850,000 active T-Mobile prepaid customer names, phone numbers, and account pins were exposed. So even if you're prepaid, you're still hosed. And finally, 52,000 names related to current Metro by T-Mobile accounts may <laughs> have been included. So, yeah, count yourself in. Okay, so identity theft is one of those things that can really screw up one's life. You need to prove that it wasn't you who applied for and received credit under your name when the other person provided, you know, the other person you're proving, you know, some other mysterious, we don't know who, other person provided all of the personal information that only you are presumed to have. Mm. So, you know, such cretins immediately run up massive charges under your name using and destroying your credit. There are tons of horror stories about the mess this has caused for people. I mean, it's ruined lives. And what's needed to apply for credit in someone else's name? Exactly the data that has just been exposed for tens of millions of T-Mobile customers because, guess what? That's what you provided to get credit from T-Mobile. They said, oh, yeah, this is what we know about people that caught, that convinced us to give them credit. Let's, let, let's have it all sold on the dark web. <laughs> okay, so this is why the absolutely number one best advice I have, the advice I give to anyone and everyone, is to simply run with permanent locks on your accounts at all three of the credit reporting bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. I've had all three locked for me since I first had talked about this years ago during one of these identity theft events. This is easily done for someone who is not routinely applying for credit. You know, Leo, those of us who have thinning hair. It's easier for of, us, yeah. It's easier it, for yeah, us. Yeah, if you're getting credit cards, you have to unfreeze. If you're getting a car, well, you have to unfreeze. And yeah, because you have to let those creditors check your credit. And by the it's, way, you have to give them your social security number, your driver's license, all of this stuff that you, this is why T-Mobile has it because they run credit exactly. checks before you can get a, a prepaid phone 
or yeah, exactly. a postpaid phone. And, yeah. and unfortunately, they don't wipe it, obviously. They just, <laughs> they just keep it. it. Why not? That's right. Yeah. I mean, we certainly the wouldn't cloud, want to secure cloud, it or anything. Cloud storage <sighs> is so cheap. It, maybe that'll be useful. Ugh. Okay. It's The good news is it has recently become easier for those who do need to occasionally unfreeze their credit worthiness. More importantly, free, thanks to federal inter intervention. Yes. It used yes. to be expensive. A couple of years ago, I realized that I was losing money by not using an Amazon-branded credit card mm. for my many purchases through Amazon since they were providing a couple of points of discount for purchases made through their own card. Why would I not take advantage of that? So I had the occasion to need to lift the locks on my credit. What I discovered was that all three of the agencies now offer a convenient, free, 10-day unlock with automatic relock. So I told them all to start the 10-day counter. I applied for the Amazon card, qualified through whichever one of the three agencies Amazon queried, and then all of them were automatically relocked. So it makes it so practical, you know, with accounts locked this way, no would-be creditor is able to query for my credit. And thus, would a, no creditor would allow a thief to open a credit account under my name. So I'll just say it again. If you have not done it, if you are not continually needing for some reason to have creditors accessing your credit with those big three firms, then why not lock those agencies down? It's trivial to do and it buys a lot of peace of mind. Doing it right now. And it's free now, as, as, as we said, to freeze and yep. unfreeze, yeah. Yep. So there, there's a there fraud are. alert and there's a credit freeze. The credit freeze is what you want. Fraud alert, Actually, you have to have fraud there, first. There's a freeze and there's a lock. The, uh, though, unfortunately, the jargon can be confusing. Mm. You, the freeze is temporary. The lock is permanent. Oh. So the lock, the lock is what you want. Okay. So I'm glad you brought it up because the, you, you do need to read through that and, and look at what it is that they're doing. But mine are just permanently locked. Lock, um, yeah. And the other cool thing is I, when I was just looking at it yesterday, I'd forgotten that there are now iOS apps that allow you, after verifying you are who you are, to use the app to unlock your credit on a, on a transient temporary basis. So it really becomes quite a practical thing to do. Again, everybody, in my opinion, and I mean, unless you're, you know, newlyweds buying all kinds of stuff and, you know, cars and homes and things just lock that stuff down uh, you want to protect your credit and and not have it destroyed by somebody i mean look at all this mess that uh, that t-mobile has just created for people oh we're going to give you a three free year oh, who uh, care you know, from mcafee yeah. of all people jeez louise oh, great in the doghouse huh, this week is proton mail and i know a lot Ooh, of our yeah. listeners are proton mail users uh, I've got, I you know my Twitter feed is full of people saying, "Hey, talk about Proton Mail, Steve. Tell us how wonderful it is." And I'm using it. And I think it's great. So, okay, and this what's you know really what I've cool. Said to everybody, and I'm vindicated now. Email is inherently insecure. Period. Yes. Don't kid um, yourself. What's cool is they got caught, and I've got it in the show notes, changing their website. Uh, so they boast on their website, secure email based in Switzerland. Uh, but that statement's meaning was changed last week. Um, I just scrolled down through their homepage at protonmail.com and oh boy, it looks wonderful. The Hacker News. You made fun of right, it when it came out because you mentioned the Swiss server in the mountain. <laughs> yes. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. So the Hacker News writes that, quote, on its website, 
Proton Mail advertises that, quote, no personal information is required to create your secure email account. By default, we do not keep any IP logs which can be linked to your anonymous email account. Your privacy comes first, unquote from them, unquote from the Hacker News. But when I just went to that page and searched for bits of that assertion, that statement, it had apparently been removed. I wonder why. Could it perhaps be? Because it was recently discovered that Proton Mail had provided location information to Swiss authorities, which directly led to the arrest of one or more of the users of their supposedly Swiss identity protecting service. Yeah, that might have been a factor. The Hacker News captured a before screenshot of Proton Mail's homepage. Right at the top, it lists its main feature categories as Swiss privacy, end to end encryption, and anonymous email. But it doesn't say that today. <laughs> Their homepage has been changed. Today, the top line still begins with Swiss privacy and end-to-end -end encryption. <laughs> but now, the third item is your data, your rules, where it previously said anonymous email. Now, I give them some serious props for fessing up and apparently thinking, okay, uh, we, we really can't make that anonymous email claim anymore, can we? You know, that had to hurt because I know these guys' heart is in the right place. I feel bad they for the French climate activist who believed them and is uh -huh. now in jail. Yep. Proton Mail acknowledged that it had received a, quote, legally binding order from the Swiss Federal Department of Justice, unquote, related to a collective called Youth for Climate, which it was, again, quote, obligated to comply with, unquote, compelling it to hand over the IP address and all information it had related to the type of device used by the group to access the Proton Mail account. Hmm. That's probably not the nature of the protection that those users of Proton Mail believed they were receiving after reading Proton Mail's original quite powerful and compelling privacy expounding homepage, which, as I've noted, no longer exists. So despite its no IP logging claims, the company acknowledged that while it's illegal for the company to comply with requests from non-Swiss law enforcement authorities, it will be required to do so if Swiss agencies agree to assist foreign services such as Europol to, uh, in, in Europol's investigations. In part of a lengthy response posted on Reddit, the company said, quote, there was no possibility to appeal or fight this particular request because an act contrary to Swiss law did in fact take place. And this was also the final determination of the Federal Department of Justice, which does a legal review of the case, unquote. Put simply, Proton Mail will not only have to comply with Swiss government orders, it will be forced to hand over relevant data when individuals use the service to engage in activities that are deemed illegal in the country. This includes monitoring its users' IP addresses. Proton Mail's founder and CEO Andy Yen tweeted, quote, Proton must comply with Swiss law. As soon as a crime is committed, privacy protections can be suspended, and we're required by Swiss law to answer requests from Swiss authorities. 
It's deplorable, He's tw- this is his tweet, it's deplorable that legal tools for serious crimes are being used in this way. But by law, we must comply with Swiss criminal investigations. This is obviously not done by default, but only if legally forced. Now, I have to and say, else? I have to say, that seems to me disingenuous. Because they were saying we don't log IP addresses. We don't preserve that information. If they had received a a warrant for information they didn't have, they wouldn't have to hand it over. So they were misrepresenting what they were doing. Well, unless the warrant said... Start logging. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Now, at that so, point, Swiss law requires they notify the subject. Uh, so that's, again, another question mark. At that point, they're supposed to tell the subject, we are now monitoring your logging. Did they do that? You know, this is never... <laughs> and this is independent of whether they're encrypting email or not. Yeah, course, yeah, yeah. Of Agreed. course they're encrypting oh, yeah. it. Absolutely, end to end, we believe that. End to end, if... The other person is going to do it with you. I mean, right. you know, you, you can't send an encrypted email across the public Internet. You can only send a link saying there's an encrypted file for you. You can or, you know, you can come unencrypted or something like that. Sure. Because Gmail doesn't well, so know how ProtonMail works. Gmail wouldn't know what to do with it. What I'm wondering, uh, you know, because, I mean, th- you know, they're loudly talking about this service. They, you know, the entire reason people use Proton Mail is to get the protection that th- they, you know, they used to claim anonymous email. So, I mean, it does seem to me like maybe their technology is not working right, but that their hearts are in the right place. Um, you know, they, uh, their business is to offer this to d- the degree they can absolute privacy. But, you know, they're certainly correct in, in explaining that if they have the ability to comply with such requests, they must by law no do choice. so. Yeah, same with Apple, same what, with everybody else. Yes, yeah. e- exactly. Yeah. Exactly where I'm going with this, Leo. What I wonder is whether it wouldn't be possible for them to design a system where it's just not possible for them to comply no matter how much they might be forced to. And then, for example, to the point you just made, we've conjectured here that one possible motivation for Apple's quite unpopular plan to compare photo signatures against a known photo signature database before uploading new photos to iCloud might actually be so that they could further lock down iCloud as they have their other end-to-end encrypted systems. You know, in other words, you know, make it impossible for them to comply to, uh, to such a request. And where there's a will, there's a way. So, you know, Proton Mail users who are concerned about the visibility of their IP addresses, I think should also take the trouble to route their access through the Tor network to obtain additional anonymity. Since email is not real-time communications anyway, routing email through Tor, which adds significant communications latency on its own because you've got to bounce through all these nodes and have onion wrappers unwrapped, to me that makes a lot of sense. Um, But... Presumably, that isn't something that these guys thought they had to do because they were being told that their IP address was not being logged. You know, who, you know, we don't know the details of whether they were told they, you know, forced to start logging um, or whether maybe they actually were logging and deleting them, you know, quietly keeping a log but never intending to publish it. Or maybe they understood that they did have an obligation to comply to, with Swiss law and were actually logging. Yeah. Uh, don't, we, we, we don't know. Wow. This has been quite a year, isn't it? Uh, hasn't it? I... Uh 
I hope things are better on on the one hand next year. On the other hand, uh, we have so much fun on security now talking about how bad things are. I don't want that to end either. Steve is committed. He's going to do a whole other year of security now. In fact, several years still to come. Uh, I, I think, honestly, this is one of those shows you just have to listen to every week. And I thank all of you who do. I know some of you are listening thanks to your company buying a membership in Club Twit. That makes me even happier. Club Twit's been a great success this year. If you're not already a member, ad-free versions of all the shows, access to our Discord server, which is so great, round the clock. And of course, the Twit Plus feed, including our Untitled Linux show, uh, Stacey Higginbotham's Book Club, Many special guests, actually Mike Elgin and Amira Elgin coming up, thanks to our uh, new community manager, uh, Amp Pruitt. He's put together a number of special events for us in the month of January. Uh, Mike and Amira, I think Jeff Jarvis joins us in January, too. Actually, we're getting booked up. All of those exclusive for Club Twit members to find out more or to join for your company. We love the corporate memberships. Just go to twit.tv slash club twit to find out more. Thanks to all of you who listen, all of you who t chat with us and discord with us. Uh, this is just a great show, but really, I guess, number one, I got to thank Steve Gibson. He works very hard to put this show together every week, and he is the master. The master, he's back <laughs> next Tuesday, uh, January 4th, a brand new security now. Do you think there'll be any security flaws to talk about? Hmm, I wonder. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.